on this Pentecost Sunday, we are having church this morning, and we've got a lot of fun stuff going on. We'll have baptisms, different things, but also tonight we'll have a Pentecost worship night. I want to invite you back to join us at 6.30 for a time of just celebrating the gift of the Holy Spirit, for a time of prayer. You'll notice even in the lobby, we have some art that's up for you to interact with and ask the Lord to speak to you. But this morning, I want to jump right into kind of our text for today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, the story of Pentecost. Let me give you a little bit of context. It's been 50 days since Jesus' death and resurrection. He's appeared to many people. He's been traveling with some of his inner crew. And we get to the point in Acts 1 where he tells them that he's going to leave. And he gives them instructions. He commissions them, but he also tells them to go into Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the counselor. Wait for the falling of the Holy Spirit. They do that. He ascends to heaven to his rightful place in The disciples go, and they wait, 120 of them in this upper room. They're not really sure what to expect. They just know that they won't miss it. And so for 10 days, they pray, waiting for the presence of the Holy Spirit to come. Acts 2 tells us the story of what took place on that day. I'll be reading verses 1 to 13. We'll put it here on the screen. It says this, On the day of Pentecost... All the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem, When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in their own native languages. This is the next part that I would like you to read out loud with me because there's a lot of difficult pronunciation. (laughs) Okay, I'll try to get through it. Here we are. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Pergia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cratians and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed, What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. This is the word of the Lord. Pentecost is the launch of the church. A group of 120 experienced the Holy Spirit. Suddenly, as we continue to read, Peter gives a sermon, and 3,000 are baptized and added to their number. As we often sing, the spirit lit the flame and the church of Christ was born. This familiar passage in Acts 2 ties together so much of scripture. We see the prophetic words of Joel 2 fulfilled here where God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. The beauty of the overall story of the Old Testament is molded with the new here. We see this continuity of God's redemptive plan for creation. You see, for the first century Israelite, they were practicing three different pilgrimages, these three festivals. The people of of Israel had been just scattered, and this is called the diaspora. And so they had been scattered all over the place. But three times a year, many would come back together for these festivals. One of them was Passover. That's the first one. That's actually when when Easter happened. And Passover was the festival where they celebrate their freedom from captivity and slavery in Egypt. The second festival that they celebrate was the Festival of Weeks or, or Shavuot. And this was this festival again where they would come to Jerusalem. It was a celebration of the wheat harvest. And it was a celebration also that tied back to 50 days after Passover when the Spirit, when God fell and spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. And the final pilgrimage that they would celebrate was the Feast of Booths, commemorating the 40 years in the wilderness. On the particular year that we're reading about here, I can't imagine this is the festival of weeks and the city is alive. This is time where the pilgrims are coming back together, but things are so different at this one. 
Because just 50 days earlier, this big event happened. The curtain in the temple was torn. There was this earthquake when this guy that they some claimed was the king of the Jews breathed his last. In fact, there's rumors spreading that he rose from the dead. That all took place during that Passover celebration 50 years ago. And now here on another important Jewish holiday, on this Israelite pilgrimage, something else big happens. You see, this festival of weeks was a big deal. It really was just a study and a tie back. At 50 days after the Passover celebration, Pentecost means 50. God had displayed his glory on Sinai with a thunderstorm and fire. God had spoken to Moses on this mountain, creating a covenant with his people. And in the festival to celebrate that, the dwelling of God again returns. This time, the Holy Spirit takes the form again of fire and windstorm. Do you see the connections? Easter takes place on Passover, freedom. Here we have Pentecost taking place during the Feast of Weeks, the presence of God falling. These connections are important. Pentecost occurs on the holiday celebrating God meeting his people. It's his presence. Something great is happening. To a first century reader, this concept of wind and fire coming into a room would signify the presence of God a clear connection back to what they had come to celebrate anyway. But this time, though, the fire of God doesn't come on a mountain with a level of fear and inapproachability and awe, but rather the fire settles on everyone in the room. The faithful God who had showed his covenant to his people is at it again, but this time the end result is that his fire stays upon, upon, among his people and now, with his presence, they carry that presence everywhere they go, heaven on earth. I sometimes wonder what it was like for the 120 people in that room. Days of waiting, anticipating, not sure what to expect. I'm sure there was great levels of, of impatience as well in the room. And then all of a sudden, the sound of heaven touching earth. The sound of heaven touching earth, it changed everything. And today I want to briefly look at three aspects that the gift of the Holy Spirit brought on that day of Pentecost that still apply for us today. You see, when the Holy Spirit fell, he came for power for holy living. He came for power for mission. And God's redemptive plan took the next steps. The sound of heaven touching earth meant that now we as a people are led by the Spirit. It's the Spirit's coming, the Counselor's coming that allows us to have counsel and guidance. In Acts 1, it's this really interesting thing because this group of people have been traveling with Jesus everywhere. And they're basically just following him. Jesus is listening to the will of the Father. He tells them, this is what we're going to do. And they're like, oh, yeah, let's do it. Here we go. Then we have this 10-day window where we're not sure how they were led, and then they receive the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the guide, and now they're led again. They receive the will of the Father. But in that 10-day period, sometimes I wonder, how were they led? It's interesting that Luke records in Acts 1 only one thing that happens in that 10-day window. You see, Judas had betrayed Jesus, and so they're looking to replace one of the 12 disciples to bring this level of wholeness. And they choose these two guys, Matthias and Justice, and they can't ask Jesus, which one of these guys do we choose? And they don't yet have the Holy Spirit to bring that level of discernment, so they cast lots. They toss the dice. I find that kind of amusing. There's like this level of cluelessness. I, I imagine what it would be like in that room, you know, to cast lots, to toss the dice. Maybe they're like, hey, Matthias, I got a number behind my back. It's between one and ten. What do you think it is? And he nailed it. Maybe it was rock, paper, scissors. I don't know what they were doing. But they had to come up with a way to bring it together to make that decision. And yes, casting lots have been part of the Hebrew tradition. But what I want us to see here is decision-making would never be the same. You see, it's interesting, too, because casting lots is something we occasionally do around here. It's how we actually chose Ephraim to be on staff. 
that's how we chose Ephraim to be a teacher and preach at RTI. It was actually down to two candidates. We'll put them up here. We didn't know, do we want John Mark Comer or do we want Ephraim Perdomo Lopez? And so we were just like, man, which one do we do? No one thought about asking the Holy Spirit. So we just cast the lots and we got Ephraim. We're super glad that we did. He's worked out great. We're super excited about that. That's a joke, by the way. We love Ephraim. We chose him. He's intelligent. The Spirit confirmed it and continues to confirm it. But my point here is that with the coming of the Holy Spirit, we get to receive new guidance, new counsel, new levels of advocacy as we move forward. Have you tapped into this? Or do you find yourself often saying with very little confidence, we'll see how this goes. I hope this one works out. You see, with the Holy Spirit's descent at Pentecost, we now have access to the guidance, to the will of the Father, for the instructions of step by step for our days. His presence is always with us. Have you tapped into his counsel? Have you tapped into his guidance? Today on Pentecost, we celebrate that we are a spirit-led people. No more tossing dice. The second thing I see here is that the Holy Spirit draws attention and points people to Jesus. You see, it started with 120 in this room, hearing the sound of heaven touching earth, experiencing the wind and seeing the fire and speaking these different languages. And what happens is they pour out from that room onto the street and the curious crowds grow. When you, when you think about the math here, Jerusalem was a city of about 25,000 people when this experience happened. Now, this was a festival, so about, it grew about four times the size. Think St. Paul on 4th of July with the rodeo. This little town all of a sudden becomes bigger. But we probably have about 100,000 people there. And it's clear that a huge crowd grows we don't know how many people listened to Peter give a message, but we know that at least 3,000 did respond. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes, it changes the atmosphere of the room. It can change the atmosphere of an entire city, of an entire country. People stop what they're doing when the Holy Spirit comes. In our denomination, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, we had a college in New York years ago, and in 1906, a revival broke out. It lasted three weeks. The students, the professors, the local pastors were on their faces, repenting, confessing their sins, crying out to God. The historians say that there was a holy atmosphere, and a mile down the road in the village of Nyack, it sounded like thunder was happening up on the hillside. Many historians say that this was a, a prelude to what would take place in California just three months later at the Azuzu Street Revival, where people gathered to confess their sins, to pray, and to worship, and the Spirit of God fell fresh. Visible things were happening, and the surrounding community took Notice. In fact, there's numerous times that the fire department was called because neighbors saw flames of fire coming out of the building. But when the firemen showed up, what they saw were the people of God praying and worshiping and confessing their sins. When the Spirit of God falls, it draws attention and it points people to Jesus. And while these are large corporate movements that we're talking about, rightly so on Pentecost, to celebrate and recognize still happen, oftentimes it happens on smaller levels as well. A person that has been walking with issues of addiction for years and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes and fully frees them and we find ourselves saying, is that even the same person? Or when a healing comes to a person and they can't keep it in and they testify to everyone that's around. Years ago when we were living in Jordan, my wife had an opportunity to connect with this woman who was in her late 30s. She wasn't able to have any kids. She had lost a couple of babies. She joined my wife's wellness program. And as my wife was praying, she received a vision of Sarah from the Bible who had a baby in their old age. And she didn't give it to her first, but the next day as she was just finishing teaching a class, she heard this woman's story. She had miscarried several times, and in that culture, she was experiencing incredible shame because of that. Her value was on her ability to produce kids. The husband's family was just ostracizing her, encouraging him to get another wife. An opportunity came, and Jess asked if she could pray for her. 
Nine months later, she gave birth to a daughter that she named Sarah. In that context, she went around telling everybody that Jesus Christ healed her body. That became a little bit difficult for us because she was so excited about it. It was bringing some dangerous attention our way, but we didn't want to stop it. The workings and manifestations of the Holy Spirit draw attention and point people to Jesus. And the last thing we see here on Pentecost is the Spirit celebrates diversity while guiding in unity. It's a really interesting thing here. Some preachers tie Pentecost to the Tower of Babel, this just scattering and frustration of the people because of they were trying to build this tower. And so God comes in and spreads them out with these different languages. And those languages divided. I, many say Pentecost is the undoing of Babel, but I feel that's a bit off. I think that Pentecost actually redeems what happened at the Tower of Babel. The undoing of Babel would simply mean that the elimination of linguistic differences would happen that everyone would be given a single language, a unifying language to speak. But what we see instead is the preservation, the acknowledgement, the celebration of these different languages. That's what's happening here at Pentecost. I sometimes miss the obvious. Sometimes there are simple correlations in life, and my family's like, Re really? Really? You didn't see that? This happened to me a couple of weeks ago at the men's retreat. We were having a great time, and our men's retreat was at this place called the Twin Rocks Conference Center. It's the first time there. What a beautiful conference center. And we're hanging out there, and all is good. And on the one morning, I had even gone over to the beach the day before and saw those two rocks sticking out of the water, and all was good. But on this day, one of the people was talking about an experience that they had when they were at the beach near the Twin Rocks. And as soon as they said that, I was like... Eureka, that's why it's called the Twin Rocks Conference Center. <laughs> I happened to blurt that out, which brought some significant laughter, and I'm like, come on, I'm the only one? Yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> Sometimes I'm slow on the correlation deal. And that has happened to me with this text this year. For years I've read this text. I've preached on this text the last, like, six years. And this year, for the first time, I noticed something different. Probably obvious to you, but to me, a new rich layer. You see, I just find it fascinating that the Spirit falls and these people are all speaking these different languages. It's like free translation is happening and it's drawing a crowd. But it's really interesting because right after that, Peter stands up and gives what seems to be a non-translated message, speaking Greek to thousands of people. It's not translated. They don't have the Interactio app that we get to have happening at this service right now. And yet they all understood it because there was a unifying language that was already present. So why did God fall and speak in all these different languages? I think part of the reason is because in the launching of the church, he wanted to show us the celebration of the different ethnic, social, and cultural differences. The Spirit is celebrating diversity while guiding us in unity. And he will continue to do that until the fullness of God returns. And heaven is experienced here on earth. And people gather around the throne from every tribe and language and people and nation. Pentecost reminds us of God's mission, that his love will be communicated in diverse languages around the world. And in that, we maintain a level of unity, a rarity in today's world. But the early church modeled this so well. People from different cultures, people from different socioeconomic levels, people of different ages, it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and their possessions to give to anyone that had need. They praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all people and the Lord added to their number daily. Church family, where are we experiencing this unity? Where are we experiencing community with those that are different than us? Spirit, break out. Continue to make this happen in our midst. Pentecost is a beautiful day of uniting the people of God yet allowing them to keep their distinctive cultures and languages intact. Pentecost is a day of expansion for the church as it grows and multiplies and has continued to do that since it started. 
And Pentecost is a time where we see the arc of redemption, God's plan continually revealed. The festival of weeks that they had come to celebrate, celebrated a a harvest of wheat. But here now there is a harvest, a spiritual harvest that happens on Pentecost. The spirit lit the flame and the church of Christ was born. When you step back and look at Pentecost, the people that experienced it had two invitations. And there are invitations that are for us today. One, there was an invitation to be baptized. And we read that 3,000 people were baptized in water on that day. Today we have baptisms, and there's, there's four very patient people waiting to go into the waters right here. But on this day, we want to open it up further. On this day, we're going to have spontaneous baptisms. And so if you are here today and the Lord is just kind of nudging you and you have a sense, you know, I've never been baptized, but I identify with Christ's death and his resurrection, and I want to publicly declare that he has saved me. Can I just encourage you? We'd love for you to join us today. Last night, we saw 12 people baptized. At the first service today, two people were baptized. How many in this room? Might God be calling to take that next step? If God is nudging you at any time now when we go back to worship, you can go to the lobby. And we have teams there that are going to ask you two questions. Is Jesus Christ in charge of your life? Is he your king, your Lord, your savior? And if so, is it your desire to follow him all the days of your life? That's it. Those are the requirements to enter the waters of baptisms. We got clothes for you to change into. We got plenty of towels. The invitation is open. But the other invitation that we see happen is a fresh experience with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that is there for some of us in this room as well. I wish that we could take back to that time when the Holy Spirit first fell. This crew had no idea what was happening. There were no traditions. There was no theology, no fear of how this could be abused or explained away. It wasn't scary. It was beginner's luck. It was this virgin experience. And if we're to be honest, we don't have that luxury. For many of us in this room, there's this baggage with regards to the filling of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've seen it abused or manipulated. Maybe it's been theologically explained away to you. Maybe it's confusing. You've seen some strange YouTube videos of bowing or whatever, and you're like, I'm good. We're good. I get that. But I also pray that the Holy Spirit would bring an eraser and that we would see it in its purity. And so if you're here today and you're looking for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, can I invite you to come? It begins with repentance. Repentance. Maybe it's a simple prayer from Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Maybe you want to come to the altar, which will be open. We will have a team over here that would love to intercede with you, to pray for you, to receive a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. The invitations are many today. The altar, the prayer team, the waters of baptism. But church, we enter back to worship, celebrating expectant of what God will do in our midst, thankful that he sent us his Holy Spirit on that day over 2,000 years ago. Let's begin with baptisms. Baptisms. 